I'm actually going to pass it on over to my uh, partner in crime, Ms. Casey Salazzo, um, to get us started tonight. All right. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Like Kylie said, especially during spring break, as many of us have, it's, it's so nice seeing you all log on. And this is great participation already at 602. So we're all appreciative of all of you. So I am the other Cisco graduate student liaison along with Kylie. Um, I just graduated and I'm a school counselor now. I just graduated Fairfield University. <laughs> um, and I'm also working to get my LPC um, right now, interning at the Center for Family justice. So I'm really excited to hear what the next steps are. Um, and we are so extremely grateful to have Dr. Sarah Zalewski hosting this event for the second year in a row. Um, she's so amazing, always so supportive of the graduate students. And we're so grateful. So Sarah is a professor at CCSU and the Cisco Professional Recognition Chair. And I'm going to let you take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much for hosting. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I love doing this. And I think as a school counselor, well, I'm a former school counselor now that I am full-time at Central, um, having my LPC uh, and the knowledge that I had so many different options kept me sane some days. So I like to share that. And now, speaking of sharing things, I am gonna, oh, may I please have permission to share my screen? Yes, let me figure out if I can do that. Okay, here we go. You should be good to go now. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Hold on a second. It's always the awkward moment when I am getting all the ducks in a row. So my apologies, everybody. It's not cooperating well today. All right. You guys should be able to see the PowerPoint. And let's do this. There we go. You guys are seeing the proper PowerPoint and not the note slide, right? Yes. Thank you for that. So we're going to talk about clinical licensure for school counselors. We're going to have some introductions. Um, we're going to talk about a quick overview of what the LPCA, which is new to Connecticut, and the LPC are. We're gonna talk about the benefits and I already shared one. Um, and then we're gonna go more in detail on what the LPCA and the LPC processes look like. And then we're gonna go into all the wonderful things you can do once you do have your LPC. And there will be time for questions at the end. Of course, at any point, if you have a question, feel free to shout it out or put it in the chat, um, which Kylie and Casey, you might have to monitor that because it's, hit itself somewhere. Um, no problem. Thank you. So first, before any we get started with anything else, I want to remind you guys to register for the our annual conference, the Cisco conference. It's May 27th and 28th, and it's going to be pretty amazing. It is virtual, and I hear there is a great presentation on CBT interventions for, interve CBT interventions for depression that you should all attend. Not to toot my own horn, but there's lots of great stuff going there. So who am I? As the lady said, I am an assistant professor of school counseling at Central. I am an LPC in private practice, and I have been doing that. This is my eighth year now. Um, the chair of the professional recognition committee with Cisca, the co-chair of the ACA professional standards committee, the president-elect of the um, Connecticut Counseling Association, and a former school counselor here in Connecticut at a middle school, which in my opinion is the best level, but I'm very biased. So we have a good number of people here. I don't know that we um, have the time for everybody to verbally introduce themselves, but I would love it if you all took a moment and dropped in the chat. Obviously your name will appear unless you have a pseudonym down. Um, but where are you coming from? Where do you work or go to school? Let's know who's here, because part of the important thing about attending these is building some connections. Oh, hooray, and I found the chat. So thank you, you made it flash. All right, so quick overview. The LPC 
versus the LPCA. So the LPCA is the newer. This is the Licensed Professional Counselor Associate. It's the step before you are an LPC. While you are an LPCA, you cannot work independently. You have to work under supervision. So someone else has to supervise. And we're gonna talk a lot about what that means, um, what you do and that person, there are very specific credentials that person has to have. The LPC is the end goal, licensed professional counselor. This is the clinical licensure that gives you free reign to operate independently. You don't need to be under supervision. Although it's always a good idea. The licensure is granted by the State Department of Public Health. And they have some very specific and helpful things on their website, which is right here. As you can see, there's a difference. And we're going to go in detail over the difference. It has if you matriculated before July 1st, 2017, or if you matriculated after. And there's a lot of things. This is a good website. If you're interested in this, bookmark it, know it. Um, you don't need my link there. If you just Google Connecticut LPC, it pops up at the top. So no matter which, the LPC or the LPCA, both require certain things. The Department of Public Health and the legislature, really, this is where this comes from, um, both clearly define minimum standards of preparation in chapter 383C of the Connecticut General Statutes. You have to subscribe to certain ethical standards for both. The ACA Code of Ethics, that's what we follow as a professional counselor. You need to follow the laws of the state of Connecticut as they pertain to counseling. And there are, it's not one of the states that has a lot of really um, odd little laws, but there are some that you do need to be aware of. And you will, you will learn that in the course of your progress towards your LPC and LPCA. And then both an LPC and an LPCA are mandated by state statute to engage in annual continuing education. Every year you have to do that, which is good because you should stay current. So why are we gonna go through all this? Cause like that's a lot of big scary words and stuffs and websites that you've got to look at. Well, it gives you some credibility. As a school counselor who has my LPC, it was clearly understood that I understood the clinical implications of whatever my kids were going through. And that helped in many ways. It helped when working with parents. It helped when working with outside counselors that clearly they had some understanding that I had some understanding of what was really going on. Um, it also helps, well, I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but it helps with the flexibility. You might find some doors open that might not be open if you didn't have clinical licensure. There are some positions out there in schools that maybe don't necessarily require it, but that it definitely will help. And I think the more we are seeing um, attention given to the mental health needs of our students, which are only gonna be exacerbated by COVID, the more we may see some of those positions opening up. When you are searching for your job, which we have all been through or are about to go through, you want to get any competitive edge that you can because sometimes, especially in certain districts, there's a lot of people applying. If you have LPCA or LPC after your name, that may make you more attractive to the whoever is in charge of hiring. Because again, it demonstrates that you have clinical skills, that you have a little bit more knowledge on what's going on for some of your kids. Flexibility is important. Um, not only when I was a school counselor did I solely work as a school counselor, I worked for a while um, with EMPS as an emergency mobile psychiatric services clinician. I had a private practice and I will be honest, scheduling is the bane of my existence. There was nothing I hated more. I swear I quit two times a year, every year, spring scheduling and fall scheduling. 
It was horrible. Um, but I never, I mean, I never actually did because I knew in my mind that it's okay. I could go get another job tomorrow and that helped keep me in my chair for the rest of the year that I really loved working with kids. And again, that adds to job security. You can have a lot of options with your LPC or your LPCA that you might not have without them. Substantial extra income is also a nice bonus. If once you reach the point where you are working in private practice, if that is your goal, and it might not be, um, roughly clinicians in the area charge from 100 to 175 an hour for counseling. So there is a financial upside to being an independently licensed clinician. But don't do it just for that. Do it for all the other awesome reasons. And the most important one, because you will have more knowledge and more skills and your students are only going to benefit from that. You will pick up on things that other people might, might not see. So here is a, a very quick overview of the path to the LPC. So obviously we're going to school, right? You have to have a master's degree, that's a minimum. If you matriculate after 7117, you have to have a 60 credit master's and a clinical internship to move to your LPCA. Once you have your LPCA, you need to take whichever exam you choose, the NCE or the NCMHCE. I will go over those in detail. You need to accumulate 3,000 hours working with, well, and not necessarily kids. You can work with grownups. You can work with whoever you want to. 3,000 clinical hours, 100 hours supervision over a period of at least two years. Once you complete those, then you can move on to the full LPC. If you matriculated into your program before 7117, you are spared the clinical internship. And when you go for your LPC, it requires a year of supervision. Although I'm going to say for both of those, there is legislation going up right now um, pending that may alter those slightly. I don't think significantly, um, but always keep updated with what the legislature is doing as far as credentialing. Um, if you are a member of CCA or you follow them on Facebook, that's probably a really good way to keep up to date. So education is the first step, no matter what you do. The word matriculated, that means to be enrolled. So if you are matriculated into a program before July 1st, 2017, you need your 60 hours. If you are matriculated into a program after July 1st, 2017, then you need to have your degree in clinical mental health counseling from KCREP, which as school counselors, that's not what we're doing because that's not what we, our main goal. So we fall under the OR, a 60 credit master's in a related field that covers certain topics. And a hundred hour practicum your school counseling practicum counts for that, so you only need to take one practicum. And you need a 600-hour clinical mental health internship, which is different from the school counseling internship. So the required coursework areas. I encourage you to go to the Department of Health website and look at those. For those of you taking notes, do not try to write these all down. Just go to the website and look. You'll hurt your hand. Here's what we, most of us are concerned about is the clinical mental health internship. So this is 600 hours at a clinical site. By state statute, your professor needs to be an LPC. This is, as I said before, in addition to your school counseling internship. So you would be doing two internships. Different programs are approaching this in different ways. Um, at Central, our school counselors are 
enrolling in a clinical internship the summer before practicum, uh, the summer before their school counseling internship, sorry, too many words. And then we have your school counseling internship during the school year when you have to have it. And then the next summer, which would be the summer after graduation, you finish with the second half of your clinical internship. So we're doing it in this summers, a sandwich on either side of your school counseling internship. 600 hours is less than we're required for a school counseling internship, but it's still a lot of hours. So you need to be thoughtful. I don't think there's any real good way to do that in one semester. I don't think that would be healthy. So two semesters, if you have normal 16 week semesters, that's about 19 hours a week. But remember, if you're doing it in the summer, summer is usually a little less than 16 weeks. I think we're at 12 or 13 weeks. Um, and the hours per week is like 25, but I am not a math person, so never trust my math, do your own. Um, and the other thing we should talk about here is at a clinical site, which when you're looking at the hours you need to do, that can help because if you have a job that is during the day, then you can look for hours, clinical hours that happen at different times of the day. Because remember, clinical work can happen pretty much around the clock if you're looking at some inpatient units, um, whereas school counseling, you are locked into school counseling at times when school's in session. So that does give you a little flexibility. So once you have completed your education, including that clinical internship, you pay $220 to the state of Connecticut and you can be an LPCA. That's the first step. So what can you do? What does that mean to have your LPCA? So you can work for an agency. You can start accumulating those supervised hours that we talked about and we're gonna talk about some more the 3,000 hours that you need to get. You can study for the licensure exam if you haven't already taken it. And some people will have already taken it by this point. We're gonna talk more about the licensure exam. With your LPCA, you may not bill insurance companies because they want you to be fully licensed and not operating under supervision before they will pay. You must, as an LPCA, complete your annual continuing education. I'm looking quickly. Oh, there's a lot of things here. Okay. Jar, you can put LPCA after your name if you have indeed applied to the Connecticut Department of Public Health and they have told you that you are an LPCA. Otherwise, you, you cannot. And actually, because when they instituted the LPCA, they took away the statutory black hole that let counselors before their LPC practice without any credential. Now you cannot, you should not practice counseling unless you have from the Connecticut Department of Public Health, either an LPCA or an LPC. Finding your clinical internship, that is an excellent question and that can be challenging, I'm not gonna lie. Um, oh, a couple of people with that same question, okay. So here's what you need to do, you need to network. You need to reach out to the people that you know and let them know you're looking for this and then don't count on that. You need to create for yourself a resume, a clinical counseling focused resume that really showcases your strong points. And you need to send it out. You need to look at the larger agencies in your area. Find who to send things to there. You need um, sorry, I got distracted by a question. <laughs> you need to just start sending your resume out to lots of different people, um, calling people on the phone. Social media can be helpful in this instance. You can reach out through social media. 
reach out to your professors, reach out to the clinical professors in your program because they may have some suggestions for sites that you can go to. Um, is there anyone in here who has done the clinical internship who wants to add to this? Just feel free to speak out if you have gone through this experience and how you found your site. I'm currently at my clinical internship right now, but I did it right after I graduated with my school counseling. So it's mm -hmm. counted as my sixth year and my um, Fairfield University helped me set it up. Okay, great. Thank you, Casey. All right. So this is networking guys, reach out to other uh, fellow students, um, counselors that you know. Um, your professor should be an LPC. I don't know if they actually actively check that. Um, I'm gonna leave that up to the individual professors to determine what the right way to handle that is. Um, Christina, I do not think you'll have to take the LPC again. You can email the Department of Public Health um, to see if you need to take the NCE again, but I think that that's good if you passed it past it. Kristen, yes, no, you do have to do the LPCA because you cannot practice counseling in the state of Connecticut without an LPCA or an LPC. So if you want to practice counseling, then you do need to do the LPCA. That's the process that you need to go through before you can start obtaining the 3,000 postgraduate hours of supervised clinical work. So do you mind if I unmute to ask the, my question? Please. I, sorry, I teach all day and it's quite annoying to see the chat all the day. Um, I am going for my LPC. I have everything but um, my test done. So I didn't know if I had to do the LPCA as well. Yes, you do. Um, if you are, and I know there are some people who are in the process right when the LPCA started and then COVID made everything weird. Um, Technically, you were at the moment that the legislation was enacted in October, you were supposed to have your LPCA before you could see any client. Okay. So it's, it's not a complicated process. It's the $220 that's the most complicated part. You can definitely do that. It's online. It's not a difficult thing. And I think it's probably, a, from what I'm hearing. I think I'm so confused. Program. I'm sorry. I don't need to do the clinical piece. Right. Okay. Right. That's, that's where I'm so, I was getting confused. I apologize. Thank you. Right. If you graduated in 2009, you were definitely on the, in the part who's grandfathered in. Okay. Because that's Thank you so much. I apologize. Yep. Nope, you <laughs> don't apologize. Um, Sir, can I, this is actually, it says, jerk. Um, but You're breaking up really Teresa, badly. Actually, but it, it, her name does chat and things. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't make out what you were saying, and I did get that Jar might not be your name. It's just what came there, and my apologies. <laughs> um, Lisa, I will give you my email address at the end of this put that in the chat. Um, you can reach out that way. Lisa, your K-Correct program was not in Connecticut, but it was only 48 credits. That is going to be very particular to your program. If you are, I know at Central, we have what we call an OCP, which is a program you enroll in to get the credits that you need if you are indeed in such a situation, because while they may be waiving the LPCA to allow someone with 48 credits, that's up for vote this legislative session. Um, you will never be able to get to an LPC without the full 60 credits. So you're gonna have to have someone look at your transcript and help you figure that out at one of the universities, whichever one you choose. Although Central's the best, but I might be biased. <laughs> okay, moving on. Continuing education, everybody has to do this. So we talk about CEUs. CEUs is a continuing education unit. It's about an hour. It's also called CEs, CEUs, 
continuing education. Um, you need 15 hours every year as an LPC and as an LPCA. It doesn't matter what your credential is. One hour needs to be on cultural competency. Two hours in your first year has to be on mental health conditions that pertain to veterans and the family members of veterans. And every six years, you need to do those two hours over again. Um, and honestly, I consider that cultural competency because being in the military is a different culture. And I, uh, I think it's important that we are educated on that, especially with the higher suicide risks. And every year you have to do three hours of ethics training. Again, very important to do because you don't wanna mess up. And the benefit of doing ethics training is most liability insurances, if you have a certain number of CEUs every year in ethics, we'll give you a discount. So do those. How do you get those? Well, if you are a member of ACA, you get 12 CEUs for free every year, which pretty much covers the cost of ACA membership. And if you are a member of ACA, it gives you the liability insurance while you are for your pre-graduate internships. After you graduate, you need to buy it. Um, other ways to get continuing education in Connecticut, that would be um, the Connecticut Women's Consortium has some great ones. The Yukon School of Social Work offers some pretty fabulous ones. Um, if you are signed up for Connecticut Clearinghouse emails, those come that's sponsored by Demas and Wheeler Clinic, you will get all sorts of things there too. So there is, there's always plenty of continuing education to be had, especially if you find the thing that you're interested in. Um, ASCA does every now and then provide some CEUs, but because most school counselors don't need actual CEUs, it's less of a thing. And I don't remember, Laura, I'm sorry, um, if there was any at the, count, at the conference. Sorry, drawn a blank. So supervision, that is something we talked about that you need to get from your LPCA to your LPC. And we are going to be looking at people who are after the July 1st date because it's a little more complicated. So you need, and this is at the top, is the wording that's in the statutes. 3,000 hours of postgraduate experience under professional supervision, including a minimum of 100 hours of direct professional supervision and the practice of professional counseling performed over a period of not less than two years. 3,000 hours, 100 hours supervision. You need to take two years at least to get it done. Oh, I see. I skipped a question. Sorry, Jar or Lisa. Um, so you graduated in 2010, took the 60 credits, passed the NCE. Congratulations. Working as a school counselor and all you are trying to complete are my 100 supervision hours. Yes, because you cannot complete the 3,000 hours or the 100 supervision hours unless you have your LPCA, because that would be practicing counseling without a license, which you are not allowed to do. Going to get there, C. Meyer. We'll shortly get to that one. Because we are going to talk a bit about supervision. It's a special area of interest for me. So what is supervision? When you have a lesser experienced counselor who is receiving guidance from a more experienced counselor, we are looking to protect ultimately the safety and well being of any client that the lesser experienced counselor works with. The main goal in this always is to protect that client, but we have other goals that are just as important. We need to increase the clinical skills of the supervisee. That's important your professional knowledge, and to ensure your well-being. Because sometimes being a counselor is not easy. So talking about how you're managing things is an important part of supervision as well. There is specific training that you can have to be a supervisor. 
there are theories of supervision, much like theories of counseling. As a matter of fact, they mimic them um, for the most part. I would say it is important to get your supervision from someone who has some supervisory training. However, the Connecticut statutes don't say that. So that's my saying it. One way that you can know that someone has gotten training in supervision is through the ACS or the Approved Clinical Supervisor Credential. In order to get that, there was supervision of supervision. There was a lot of coursework involved. If you see that, it means someone is aware of how to be a supervisor. So how do we get supervision? If you are really lucky, someone at your school, while you are going through this process, will be willing to be your supervisor and will not charge you. I was blessed to have that experience. However, sometimes you are the only mental health person at your school and you don't have that. So there are people who are supervisors who get paid to be supervisors. Um, some will charge, I know I personally charge a lot less than I charge for clients by hour um, because it's an important thing. You need to learn the things you need to learn. And while well, you're a student, there's never a lot of money. So here are the people that can be your supervisors. You can have an LPC. And I would say that would be the ideal person because then they're looking at the same laws and regulations that you're going to be working under. You can have a psychiatrist, um, an APRN who is a psychiatric and mental health clinical nurse, a psychologist, an LMFT, or an LCSW. So those are all the people who can operate as your supervisor. Um, JAR, reach out to the Connecticut Department of Public Health with a what if. I'm thinking it's possible that the COVID emergency will make this a little easier, but just um, ask them hypothetically. Um, Kristen, you don't need, mm, yes, you do. You need the 60 credits to get the LPCA or the LPC. They're looking, as I said, it may be waiving the 60 credits for the LPCA, but you will never get to an LPC unless you have 60 credits. All right, I think I'm caught up on questions. So here are the requirements. I said that we, there's not a requirement for the supervisor to have any specific training, but there are requirements. So it has to be face-to-face -face consultation. Clearly these days that means face-to-video camera consultation. Um, one supervisor and one person receiving supervision. So group supervision is not what Connecticut would like. Not less than monthly. So at least once a month, you're gonna meet with your supervisor and discuss the clients that you're working with, you're going to discuss how you're doing as a human, because that's just as important. And then the ethical, multicultural, everything questions you have. And I encourage you in a supervisory relationship, find someone who you really mesh with, someone who you are able to be super honest with, because there is not a person who goes through supervision to be a counselor who at one point in time isn't gonna have to or want to say, hey, I don't have a clue what I'm doing and I might've just messed up. I need you to help me. And you have to have that person be someone you can have that conversation with. So be picky. That's an important person in your professional world. And at the culmination, there is a written evaluation and assessment by the supervisor of the supervisee's practice of professional counseling. And this is what it looks like. This is the form. So we see it's, that there's more stuff at the top that you put like your name and your address and whatnot, but I didn't feel that was incredibly important. You, your supervisor's name and title, you mark off all the things that apply and then note at the bottom, they want us to say yes or no. This is your evaluation. 
do you have any derogatory information regarding the competency or conduct of this individual? This is what your evaluation looks like. So that's supervision. Any questions on supervision before I move forward onto the big honking exams? Okay. Sarah, and again, sorry. Is I, go uh, ahead. Just to double check, I want to clarify, and I know we've been, we've all been asking this and double checking this, but for all of the school counselors who have been in practice, who have completed their NCE, who have completed their 60 credits, they have to apply for the LPCA first and then their 100 hours of supervision and then they will get their LPC. You need to get that 3,000 hours with the 100 hours of supervision. So right. for the NCE, I had to get that already? No, uh, no, you don't need that for the NCE. The, the hours are not for the exam. The hours are for the LPC. Okay, because I had to submit that for the NCE and they said it was qualified for under school counseling. That would be interesting because we have graduate students who are still in school that take the NCE and that clearly they've not had postgraduate supervision. I know, it was fun to figure this all out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Thank you. And it is complicated. So reach out, guys. Don't be shy to reach out to the people around you who have been through this and, and ask the questions multiple times if you need to until it makes sense because it's complicated. Um, okay, let me see. I just saw one. How do you seek a supervisor that would be a good fit for you? That is an awesome question. So to do that, you need, just like if you were looking for a counselor or a doctor or a whoever, you want to communicate. And sometimes that's through email. Sometimes, I mean, these days, it's real easy to jump on Zoom with someone and just have a quick chat about what supervision looks like with them, what they expect, what they expect from you, and see how you click. Read about them. The internet is a wonderful place. Um, Karen, you completed your hours in shortly after 2005. I would reach out to the Department of Public Health and see what they say about that, because I think that's just very, a very different situation than um, I've run into. Yes. So um, my supervisor who oversaw my 100 plus hours, we were together over a number of six years. And so she was able to license or approve others um, processes for their LPCs as they were on the continuum. So we had somebody right on site. Mm -hmm. um, so over the course of the last 14 years, I've done the 3000 hours and also have the 150, 200 supervised hours um, and collaboration with my LPC supervisor. So I guess that LPC A piece is just really confusing me because that's okay. already signed by her. So if you have all your supervision hours done, you have your degree, have you taken the exam? No, the, I searched for like an hour online last week with a friend and we couldn't find the link and that, okay. that's really the reason why I'm here. <laughs> oh my gosh, we will get you through that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like that's the last piece in the puzzle that you need. Okay, great. To move forward I, I, to the LPC. You might not need to go to the LPCA. Um, okay. But because it has been so long, I think the Department of Public Health will be okay with that, but okay, we'll find out. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. It's reassuring, so I appreciate that. Okay, so on to examinations. Your exams are provided by the National Board for Certified Counselors, NBCC. And if you see the little 
logo in the lower right hand corner. That's how you know you are on the right website. It has that on there. There are two exams you can take, the National Counselor Exam, the NCE, or the National Clinical Mel Mental Health Counseling Exam, the NCM HCE. And I always get those letters mixed up, so I apologize in advance. Um, you can take both if you want, but I don't know why anyone would wanna subject themselves to that or pay the amount of money that it would cost, um, but you could. What you do wanna consider very carefully it are your future plans. If you plan to stay in Connecticut, then take whichever exam appeals to you the most. If you plan to move somewhere else, look and see what that state requires. Because Connecticut will take either, but some states are, will only take the NCE or only take the NCMHCE. So consider what states you would like to be licensed in before you select your exam. So to sit for the exam, some students are signed up by their university in the last semester of their program. Or once you have your master's degree, you send a um, transcript to NBCC along with your application and the 300 something dollars and say, I wanna take your exam. And they say, cool, you can sit for it or, oh, you're missing this coursework, go get it and then come back which is why it's always wise to save your syllabuses. Save those syllabi, print them out, put them in a binder, save them in your Google Drive, just have them. Because if you need to argue with the NBCC, you need those to back you up. The NCE, we're gonna talk about this one first. And remember, you have a choice in Connecticut, you can sit for whichever one your heart desires. The NCE is 200 multiple choice questions. 160 of those choice, choices count. 40 of them are them testing questions for future administrations of the NCE and they do not count towards your score. However, you do not know which questions count and which ones don't. It's broken up into different sections, different domains. You have professional practice and ethics, which is 12%, intake assessment and diagnosis, areas of clinical focus, treatment planning, counseling skills and interventions, which is rightfully 30% of your exam, because that's a big part, and core counseling attributes. Those are the areas which they did a study on what do professional counselors do, and that is how they determine what their domains would look like. It was based on an, a study in a job analysis. You have three hours and 45 minutes to complete all 200 questions. Remember, you have no clue which ones count and which ones don't, so they all count. You do these at the Pearson View Test Centers, or for the NCE, you can do this at home with secure testing on a secure browser. However, I would be crystal clear that you have a computer that is capable of doing all the things and that your internet is capable of keeping you connected for that extended period of time. Otherwise, if something weird happens and your internet goes out, they may think that you've cheated and you may have to start over again. They might just throw out what you've done. You don't want to be that person. So be very certain if you decide to do the online at home testing that you are capable of remaining connected. The passing score, it varies from administration to administration because depending on some great big statistical equation that they have, they determine what their cut score is going to be and it varies. So anyone who tells you that you have to get over 120 to pass, well, that might've been true for when they sat for it, but it won't be true for when you sat for it because it's gonna be very different. Um, there is the link to read about the exam. But again, if you type into Google NBCC, NCE, bam, you'll be right there. Here's an example of what the questions look like. NCE questions are multiple choice questions. You, they will ask you things about what are, this one is an ethic question. What, what does this um, professional ethics require you to do? A, give free counseling to 25% of minority clients. B, provide 10% off for services for clients with children. C, 
devote a portion of their practice for which there is little return, or D, charge clients with higher income more and those with lower income less? That might be it. And the answer to that one is C. So these questions may ask things like, what does this theory mean? Who is the theorist? General knowledge questions. If you sat for the CPCE, the NCE is very similar. Um, Kristen, you had a comps exam. That could be the CPCE, which is very, very similar to the NCE. Uh, Ray, if you're gonna get the LPC, you need the 60 credits, but you don't need the exam until you go for the LPC. You don't need it for your LPCA. Next exam, the NCMHCE. In this exam, which they just revised, you will have 12 to 14 clinical simu simulations. The first thing they do, and I'm gonna walk you through one here. This is from the material that they have online. Um, they're gonna give you information. So clearly we know a little bit about this. We have a diagnosis here already for this situation. And then it gives you the mental status exam, family history, the presenting problem, a lot of details. And this is what you will get when you sit for your exam. And then it will give you questions based on the information you just read. So what are your next steps? The first question is, what data are you gonna gather next to figure out the client's level of functioning? The ones where the asterisks are the answers they want. This is on their website. You can download the, the NCM. HCE handbook and look at it. And then the second question, you're, they're curious about treatment planning. So what do you need to gather to, to guide the development of the treatment plan? These are very much scenarios that they are walking you through. In these, you have 225 minutes to complete this exam. You must take these at Pearson View. There hasn't been, um, to my knowledge, I don't think they're ready to roll out this that you can do at home. The domains are a little different and you notice it's 10 to 20% of items, but professional practice and ethics, intake assessment and diagnosis, treatment planning, counseling skills and interventions and core counseling attributes. This is what will be covered in this, these exams. And very much the same as the NCE the passing score varies from test to test. So if someone tells you that they passed with 130, don't assume that means you're going to, that that's a passing score because it changes every time you take it. To prepare for your exam, there are tons of options. NBCC will give you a page where you can look at all the different options and there are a lot. And if you just Google NCE exam prep, you can sit there for hours and hours looking through them all. My favorites, um, Rosenthal's Encyclopedia of Counseling. I recommend my students purchase this and you know treat it as their counseling Bible. It's an important book, it's useful. And he also has CDs, which I know is a little archaic to have CDs. And some cars don't even have CD players anymore, but if you can, in one of my cars, I had to put a boom box in the front seat. I felt very 1980s, um, but I did that. And listening to the CDs was a huge help to me. I have to say, sorry, I just took my um, CECE and I have the book on Kindle and the, the CDs and the CDs were wonderful. It, it was a different format from the book. So it wasn't word for word. So mm -hmm. I listened to the CDs first. And then when I went and took the sample questions in the book, um, I was like, oh, I remember that from the CD. So it gives you a chance to study whether you're in the car, in bed, looking for something to sleep by. Or I was hoping that I would learn it while I slept. But, <laughs> but, they, but they're both, they're both um, wonderful to have, very helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, I found the way he said things on the CDs was amazing um, and helped 
and some of it was just super corny funny, but it helped me remember it. Uh, it was like ultra dad humor for counselors. I also liked Dr. Linton's NCE CPCE test prep at nationalcounselingexam.com. I have not getting any kickbacks from these people. I'm just saying for me, those were helpful. Um, there was a free sample exam. Before you take your exam, do not spend the last day studying and cramming. That's not gonna work. You want to start months before and slowly start reviewing. And you will know a lot of this stuff from your program if you have recently graduated. This is not something you need to hurry up and cram into your brain because it just won't work. There's just a huge amount of knowledge. I mean, the book's like three inches thick. There's a huge amount of knowledge. But take your time, do it slowly. You're scheduling your exams. You know when you're going to take them. Give yourself a few months to just make it part of your routine. There are apps you can download on your phone. Um, there's all kinds of ways to study. There's There used to be, and I, I couldn't find it when I looked, um, but there used to be a website where you signed up and they sent you a exam question to your email every day. I imagine that's still out there somewhere. I just couldn't remember who it was. Definitely not a difficult thing. Okay, so when it's time to be an LPC, if you have done all the things we have talked about, you have the education, which may or may not include your clinical internship. You have done the supervision. You have taken whichever exam called to your heart and passed it. Then it is time to reach into your wallet, go to the Connecticut Department of Public Health online portal and apply for your LPC. That's an exciting moment. Oh, Lisa, you will remember it. You will remember a lot of this information and maybe if figure out how you learn. If you are someone who learns by listening, get those CDs and just have them be your background music for a few months. You'll, you'll be fine, it'll come back. Sarah, so yeah. I'm at the part where I'm hoping to pay the State Department of, Edu of Health. The online portal, Am, I feel like I'm mailing things in. Am I looking at the wrong portal? Um, I'm looking it up over here. Excuse me, guys, while I'm looking at my other Because one. I'm hoping you magically say everything can be uploaded and submitted online instead of having to put mailings together. Um, I talked to someone who was doing it online. No, it does have a lot of forms on here. Yeah, right down at the very bottom, if I'm looking at the, the page, the very bottom says applications are only accepted online. Please select this link and I will put the, the page that I am on into the chat box. If you scroll down to the very bottom, it gives you a link to apply online. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Um, Karen, the exam, because it's offered through Pearson View, I think it's offered fairly regularly. It's a matter of scheduling. And right now with things being weird, thanks to COVID, I can't answer that question and I'm not gonna try because <laughs> I don't know how it's impacting them right now with all the distancing and whatnot. I just took my exam this winter. Um, and so they still had it and they everything was just spaced out really well. And they took your temperature when you went in. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. And Thanks. what you guys need to know when you go, they like take everything on you and they lock it in a locker and it's like walking into a jail. They're checking everywhere. They want you to turn your pockets inside out. I think they had like a metal detector, but I don't remember. It was crazy. That's what I remember. So follow the instructions. They're serious. So once you have sent your money to the Department of Public Health and you check in the portal and it says you have a license, which will happen before you actually get anything in the mail or your email. So if you check that portal every morning, if you're, I don't know, obsessive, like um, some people are, then that would be the way you would find out. 
And so congratulations, you made it. So what do you do now? Well, that's what you got to figure out. What are you going to do now? And for some of you, it will be, I'm just going to have it and know I have it. And that's enough for me right now. Um, because it's options that you can have later and maybe you're not jumping into something else. However, if that is you, every year you need to do your CEUs so that you can keep it. And then of course you got to pay them. Um, that's not a surprise, right? But definitely every year you need to do your CEUs. You can go into private practice, which I highly recommend once you feel competent and that you understand whatever it is you choose to work with. And most people pick an area where they specialize. I work with kids. That is my thing. I like kids. They make sense. Grownups are scary. Um, so you pick your thing. You have to be mindful that you will have some expenses as a private practice owner that you may not in other ways to use your counseling degrees. Um, you will have to have liability insurance, but I am telling you, even if you are working in an agency, please have your own liability insurance because if the agency has liability insurance, who are they looking out after first? It's going to be the agency and not you. So have your own insurance. You may want to incorporate and get your LLC that puts some legal distance between your business and your personal lives. I did that. I, and it was not complicated. It costs like 80 bucks to do it online with the state of Connecticut. Um, but you also have to understand what it is that you're doing. So for some of you, that might mean talking to an attorney who understands it a little bit better than you do, which is a good investment. Accounting and taxes. Um, as a self-employed person, your taxes are a little different than the rest of the world because things like Medicaid and um, there are things that are taken out that aren't, that are taken out when you have a job that you have to account for when you are your job. So I have an accountant who is a saint. Highly recommend it. Advertising. People are not just going to find you because you're there. You need to let them know you're there. Most people have a Psychology Today website. Um, I've got to say that's probably my most effective method of advertising. However, Google ads work pretty well. And they give you like 150 free dollars every so often if you do whatever. Um, just look out for that. It's nice when that happens. You have to pick your space. If you are going to be working in private practice, how does what's that going to look like? Right now, it looks like, um, much like it does right this very second, <laughs> I'm sitting here talking to my clients through the computer. Pre-COVID, most people had offices. What is your office going to look like? How is that? How are you going to set that up? For many of us who are going to be school counselors and in private practice, that might mean sharing an office because why do you want to pay $100 a month when you're there for two nights? That's crazy. So figure it out. I also started, um, when I first started my private practice, I didn't keep an office. I went into the homes of my clients and I did my work there. And I didn't have to have pay for an office. There was no overhead with that other than, you know, car from point A to point B. So there are ways around it. But if you do have an actual space, you're gonna need things to put in your space. So you need to account for those expenses as well. Supervision. I encourage you, especially if you're in private practice, to have supervision because you will have no other humans to talk about this stuff with. And sometimes that is really healthy and important. I'm still in supervision and I probably will be forever because I like the ability to be able to talk about the things. And sometimes that only means talking about, all right, I was working with this kid and the stuff he told me hurt my soul. So I got to talk about this with someone and because you're my supervisor. I can do that. And then again, training, CEUs. If you want to specialize, training gets more expensive. EMDR is very popular. That training is a little pricey. Um, I'm doing, getting certified as a play therapist and that costs a few dollars too. So depending on where you want to go, training. But the benefits, you set your hours, you work when you want to work, you work where you want to work. I have had sessions with clients on hiking trails. It's pretty cool. 
You do what works for you because it's all yours. Of course, the problem is it's all yours. There is no one to back you up. It's you. You can arrange for inst um, other clinicians to back each other up, but for the majority, if something bad happens, it's you. And you are going to need backup. What if you need to go on vacation? Or, God forbid, but you get really sick and you need to be out for a couple of months unexpectedly. You need to have someone to send your clients to. So that's just an ethical obligation. Find someone. And again, get supervision. So private practice. What I do is the sole proprietor model. It's me. Me, myself, and I. We are our team. That was not a pathological we, just to clarify. Um, you can also have a co-op or a shared practice. This is where like you rent a suite and everybody has their own practice and you're just sharing like the expenses that go with rent and electricity and cable or whatever you have there, but your independent practices sharing a physical space. You could be a contract counselor where you get paid to work at independently or a 1099 employee in someone else's practice, or you can hire people as 1099 employees to work in your practice. If you ever decide to do that, please consult with an attorney and an accountant because it's com complicated. You can have group practices. And in a group practice, I could sit here for the next probably half an hour and tell you all the different ways those can be structured. Just know you can structure those any number of ways that you can get a group of people to agree on. And you can have a group practice, and this is the most simple one, and you're the boss, and you pay everybody else, either salaries, hourly rates, whatever you want it to be. So that's what private practice looks like. There are tons, tons of ways that can look, and it all depends on what you want, because you'll be in charge. But what you need to know is even though you're in charge, there are people holding your purse strings. And sometimes it's annoying. I'm talking about insurance. Um, you can bill insurance as an LPC, which is great because you can have more clients that way. The downside is some insurance panels are a real pain in the hiney. Um, and some don't pay very well. So an hour of counseling on insurance panels can go from and I'm guessing on the low end from what people have said to me, but around 40 to $60 up to 120, depending on which panel you're paneled with. And they will not tell you until they send you, until you've jumped through all their hoops and they're sending you the contract to sign with them. Before that, it's kind of a guessing game. And there are rules that they have where no one is allowed to tell other people how much they get paid on a particular panel. It's a fascinating thing, and I'll just leave it there. So to become paneled, you need a location, you need liability insurance. Those are, you know, pretty basic. You need to enroll for an NPI, a National Provider Identifier Number. You do this online, it's not difficult. Um, you just go Google NPI, it will pop up. Um, you enroll with CAQH, Council for Affordable Quality Health Care. So every three months I have to go into CAQH and update my liability insurance and all the information about my practice. Then it sends this information to the insurance companies. You will not get on insurance panels without an NPI and a CAQH profile. And once you have those things, you can apply to panels. Some are easier. Some can take months. Husky was easy. Um, I hear Anthem is a bear, but that's just not uh, something I'm interested in. Okay, agency work is another option if you have an LPC. And you have to decide where, where do you wanna go? Do you wanna work with a small agency or a really large one? What is your goal? What's your specialty? Sometimes when you are starting out, this is the best place to get experience, especially if you have or desire to have a specialty and you want to work with some people who are really good at whatever it is you want to do. This is a great way to get some training and have the agency pay for it. So expenses. 
Liability insurance, have your own. I mean it. Training. Usually agencies will provide you with training. That's why there's a question mark there, which is fabulous. Usually they will also provide you with supervision. However, your supervisor at agency work may be someone who is also your job evaluator. You may not be comfortable with them. You may not have a choice in that person. So sometimes you may still wanna have outside supervision. A thing to consider once you get your feet wet. Know that is always an option. The benefits of agency work is you have consistent pay. You know, I'm working this many hours this week and they're gonna pay me however much they said. It's not, in private practice, it can be, okay, everybody wants to see me this week and so I am working for, you know, however many hours. And then two weeks later, everyone wants to go to the beach and no one wants to see me and so I'm not working much at all. You just never know what it's gonna happen. Agency is consistent. Agency work may give you benefits, health insurance, vacation time. Again, supervision on site. The responsibility, the major responsibility for all business decisions isn't yours. You just gotta show up. Someone else is handling the major decisions. It is, as I said, a great way to build experience and to make connections with other people who are in this field because you're gonna bump into tons of people in an agency. Um, pay may not be, okay. Pay will not be as good in an agency as in a private practice because they have tons of overhead. So consider that. Um, there are trade-offs with that too. There are pros and cons. There's no right or wrong here. Our demands, they may want you to work more than you wanna work or they may not want you to work as much as you do. So look at those things and see how it fits into your world. Because if you're working full-time as a school counselor, um, that's your main job. And you're going to want to make certain that whatever it is works around that really well. Again, that's the path. That's how we do it. But it's, you know, it's not just that. Questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. Don't everybody jump. It always happens. Um, I have a question, Sarah. Um, I'm another Sarah at the top. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, hi. So I think this question has been asked about five times, and I just am having a little trouble wrapping my head around it. So I'm another one who graduated a while ago, graduated okay. from Fairfield in 2009. Um, I took my NCE right away and passed that. I, okay. had 50, I had 54 credits at the time, which is what Fairfield required. But since then, I've done another six credits um, after graduating. Okay. So I'm hoping that would count. I do have 60 post-college credits. Um, and I am painfully going through my supervision. I'm lucky enough, I have somebody at school who will supervise me, which is wonderful, but it's just going very slowly. It's a half an hour at a time. It's been years already. I think it's gonna be a few more years. But my understanding was that was my last piece that I had to finish, that I had everything else. Is that true? Because I think you did say that to Karen, so that, so that I could go for the LPC because I have all of those. Um, but you haven't finished your supervision. So technically you should have your LPCA right now. Oh, I should? You should. You oh. have qualified for the LPCA. Okay. And I don't know how seriously the Department of Public Health is looking into, um, say, if you're turning your application for an LPC that says you have been doing these counseling hours, but they have no record of you as an LPCA, which means you've been doing it without a license, which, which is illegal. I don't know what their what their look what their thought process is behind that oh, because so I'm not them. I don't think I'm doing anything illegal because I'm not practicing anything. I'm just at my little school <laughs> doing okay. my work. Is, okay. that, is that illegal? I don't think so, right? No. So I'm not doing anything. I'm not practicing separately. That's what I want to also If that's I'm, the only thing that you're doing, I think you're okay. Yeah. So I'm not if you're seeing anything. clients in any other setting, that that, that no. could get really hairy really quick. Exactly. I can understand how that would for sure. All right, so um, if I wait until I finish my supervision hours, then I could actually apply directly for the LPC, but that would be suspicious or that would be okay? Um, they may still have <laughs> questions. They may still have questions, um, but 
I don't see where you're doing anything wrong. This is a time their emails on the website. It might be good to reach out and say, hey, okay, this is what I'm doing. And they may encourage you to get your LPCA, which is okay. just nifty initials. Yeah, that's just the initials. Of initials. Yeah, that's, a, that's fine. This is the first time I've heard of it. So I'm go so glad I'm on here. It's so informative, fantastic slideshow and information. So that part's really good. It seems to me they probably want me to get my LPCA so I can give them that my money every year. <laughs> Not that I'm a yeah. cynical person because I'm not a cynical person, but I don't need it for anything else, you know, because I'm probably not going to be doing anything on my own for a few more years, but whatever makes sense. I'll, I'll try and sort it out. I'll try and go on the website and see if there's anybody who can give me some advice about it. They are responsive to emails. I have sent okay. emails in the past and they do. It's not it. If you send them one tonight, it won't be answered tomorrow, oh, but course. it will be answered. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So along with that, so if, if you completed your hours prior, you said um, the law changed. When did LPCA come in? In October? Um, I want to say it was the October before COVID. So 2019. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll forever remember 2020. Um, so before in, in October, before October 2019, if you completed all your hours prior to that, you don't have to worry about the LPCA. But if you're currently still working towards your hours, you should get your LPCA. Yes. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a nice summary. I think that helped more than just, you know, you. Um, Ray, I recommend you reach out to a university and have them look at your transcript and see what you need. Because there may be an area where you don't have um, the classes. Remember at the very beginning, there. And you can go to the Department of Public Health website and you can see all the areas where they want you to do things. So go there and um, bring your transcript to a university and say, this is what I want to do and I need help and they'll evaluate it for you. Any other questions? Hey, well, I want to thank you guys all very much for being here. I think the questions have been so helpful in making everything clear. So thank you to you guys who asked. Oh my gosh, Ray, that's adorable. Um, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Casey and Kylie for putting this together. Um, thank you, Sarah. This has been absolutely amazing. Please, I know I say emojis and whatnot, but please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Sarah Zluski. She's been so amazing. Thank you all of you for being here tonight, especially if you had spring break this week. I Like I said, I know I already alluded to that, but lovely seeing you all. Um, again, I will plug one more time uh, a Cisco conference. Um, you can find it on our website, the NCYI website. Um, it's going to be a really great time. I, there's been a lot of people working behind the scenes to make that happen. We are really excited. So I know I have a couple of other Cisco member, Cisco board members on here. Um, so if you have anything else to add, feel free to jump on in. But if not, I think, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for doing that. This has been such an amazing PD. Very useful for, to me. And I try to come to them, even if they're not like essentially my area of expertise, but this was very, very helpful. Thank you so much, Sarah and Kylie and Casey. You are amazing. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much, Dr. Zalewski. This was wonderful. I saw someone writing in the chat asking if the presentation would be available. And I saw that Kylie responded saying that this will be posted on the YouTube page, but um, it, would you be willing to share the PowerPoint as well for those that attended or how would you like to handle that? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think I can share it. It's it totally help. up to you. We have we have this recorded, so anybody mm -hmm. can go back and rewind if they have questions, right? Oh, I can I can share that. Who would I send it to? Um, we can either send it to our registration list that we already had, or perhaps it, if it's easier, people could reach directly out to you. Maybe there if there's not, oh, you yeah. know, not too many uh, requests for that. Like Casey said, it would be recorded. We can also There's my email, guys. I said I would do that, and I lied. Um, sorry. It's there now. Get to Virginia to put on the website, so under the resources, it would be a good fit there. Okay. Oh, Laura, you're brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone wants to stay on, I'm sure Dr. Zaluski will answer questions. Um, but if not, happy 